course, one of the questions, one of the key questions that we was, was raised this morning in, in this morning's panel uh, was the question of the future democratization of China, whether China would become a democracy or not, based on this sort of democratic peace theory. And this is the, the topic uh, of this panel that we're presenting now. And for this, to discuss this very, very key issue uh, in our uh, U.S.-China relations, we have a very distinguished uh, group here. Uh, paper givers will begin beginning with Professor Edward Friedman, directly to my right. He teaches courses on Chinese politics and on the challenge of democratization at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Madison, he is just finishing a volume entitled Learning to Lose, Transitions in Single Party Dominant Systems. Mm -hmm. By exploring China's political future, he has also published the Politics of Democratization, Lessons of the East Asian Experience, uh, National Identity and Democratic Prospects in Socialist China, and What if China Doesn't Democratize? Implications for War and Peace. His uh, topic is Waiting for uh, Democratization, Wait, Waiting for Democracy, which of course is taken from Waiting from Godot, I suppose. <laughs> uh, our second uh, paper is presented by uh, Professor uh, and Andy Nathan, or Andrew, Andrew Nathan, Andrew J. Nathan, class of 1919 professor of political science at Columbia, who's been teaching at Columbia University since 1971, co-editor uh, with uh, Perry Link of the Tiananmen Papers, a major sort of uh, eye-opener on the Chinese elite politics in 2001, co-author with Bruce Gilley of uh, China's New Rulers in 2002, and he has given papers recently at the Carnegie, Endow Environment, uh, Car Carnegie Endowment, excuse me, and uh, at the Brookings Institution on, on what he calls China's resilient authoritarianism. Today he's going to discuss some uh, findings from an cross-national survey research project that he is uh, involved with. And as discussants, we have uh, Professor Sui-Sheng Zhao, who is professor and executive director of the Center for China-U.S. Cooperation at the Graduate School of International Studies, uh, University of Denver. Uh, he is founding editor of the Journal of Contemporary China and is author or editor of nine books or monographs. His most recent books include Debating Political Reform in China, Rule of Law versus Democratization, M.E. Sharp, 2006, A Nation State by Construction, Dynamics of Modern Chinese Nationalism, uh, published by Stanford University Press in 2004, and Chinese Foreign Policy, Pragmatism and Strategic Behavior, uh, M.E. Sharp, 2003. Uh, China and Democracy, Reconsidering the Prospects for a Democratic China, Rutledge, uh, 2000, and Across the Taiwan Strait, Mainland China, Taiwan, and the Crisis of 1995-1996 with Rutledge in 1999. And uh, last but by no means least, Kevin J. O'Brien is the Bedford Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Center for Chinese Studies at the University of California at Berkeley. His research focuses on Chinese politics in the reform era. His most recent work centers on theories of popular contention, particularly the origins, dynamics, and outcomes of protest in the Chinese countryside. He is the co-author with Bian Zhang Li of Rightful Resistance in Rural China, Cambridge, 2006, and co-editor with Neil Diamant and Stanley Lubman of Engaging the Law in China, State, Society, and Possibilities for Justice, Stanford in 2005. Professor Brian is currently working on a new book, Popular Contention in China, which will be published in uh, late 2008. So we look forward to that. So without further ado, we will begin then with Professor Friedman. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Lowell. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. 
It's a genuine honor to be part of this uh, Institute's uh, inaugural event. It's gotten off to a great start, and I certainly wish the Institute uh, continuing uh, greatness in the, in the future. Uh, my goal um, is to address the issue of uh, political reform in China's future. I'm going to try to do this by uh, sketching answers to uh, four questions. First question is, how well can you expect analysts to do in forecasting the future. Harry Harding already chatted about that. I'm going to chat a little more. Two, is, is the mainstream consensus on China's future correct on three matters, which questions two, three, and four? One, is China's rise fragile because the nation is so beset by so many deep problems? I think this is a consensus issue, as in the new book by uh, the very uh, wise and able uh, Susan Shirk, China, the Fragile Superpower. Three, is the consensus correct that China is integrating into global norms and therefore adapting practices which make democracy ever more likely, either because of institutional adaptation or liberal international forces, that is, uh, markets producing uh, uh, middle classes, et cetera. Um, and so we all live happily ever after. Four, is the con consensus correct that America and other democracies should be, and perhaps are already, acting in harmony with the logic of both institutionalism and liberal internationalism in trying to facilitate China's transition to <coughs> democracy? The presupposition of this uh, last question is that since China is fragile, it could go in less happy directions, and therefore the whole world should be doing whatever little it can to help it go in the, uh, in the co correct direction. Okay, number one. How well can you expect to do in predicting uh, China's uh, future? Um, I think we have a uh, record on this, uh, which bears out a point made in the uh, writings of uh, Karl Popper on historiography. Basically, you can't predict futures. Futures are contingent, especially in politics, and they always are uh, going to uh, surprise us. I have uh, still vivid memories of the annual Mao succession crisis conferences. Um, and I can assure you nobody came close to imagining uh, the fantastic entrepreneurial frenzy and economic takeoff uh, that actually occurred in China. And if anybody had suggested such a thing before Mao's death, they would have been dismissed out of hand as a fantasist. Um, uh, and it isn't just about uh, uh, China. Uh, the uh, uh, head of the government in West Germany, only one year before the wall came down and the two Germanys reunited, gave a speech in which he rued the fact that he would never leave to live to see. Um, a united uh, Germany. In August 1991, just as uh, the Soviet Union imploded and uh, nationalities broke apart and created their own uh, republics, the prestigious journal World Politics was coming out with a special issue on nationalities in the Soviet Union. And all the greatest experts all over the world agreed that the Soviet Union had solved this problem and nationalities was no longer a problem for unity in the, uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, as uh, was said uh, earlier uh, today during the uh, hearings on uh, permanent on, uh, normal trade relations with China for the WTO, the guarantee uh, was given uh, that it would lead on to democracy in uh, China. Here is the uh, uh, father of the present president of the United States right after uh, the uh, uh, bloody crushing of the democracy movement on June 4th, 1989, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. And he said that an economic engagement between America and China had produced China's 1989 attempt at freedom and would one day successfully deliver it. Since, he went on, since commercial contacts have led to this quest by the Chinese people for freedom, therefore America should act in a way that will encourage the further development and deepening of that relationship with China and the process of democratization. Um, I actually think that this uh, notion that uh, China would inevitably democratize was the consensus uh, position in the uh, country as uh, spelled out in the recent book by uh, Jim Mann until basically I think it starts to change when people become disillusioned with uh, what uh, Hu Jintao is uh, going to deliver. But the key point in all of this is that none of us can predict the future. And uh, this is an exercise in I'm not sure what, but at best it's to make you sensitive to things which uh, may surprise you. So I'm going to predict uh, two futures. I'm going to predict both of which probably will be laughed at by reality. Um, and therefore we should have a friendly conversation because uh, we're all likely to be very wrong. Um, uh, my first, I'm going to make a uh, prediction uh, uh, 
projecting present trends, and then I'm going to make a prediction in case the present trends uh, get into trouble. So the second question is, is the Chinese polity uh, fragile? Um, and uh, the way you explain how the ch Chinese uh, uh, polity is fragile is you uh, list uh, the, the uglies, the horribles, the problems. Here's one. Rampant official corrupt, tr corruption, environmental degradation, major health crises, the absence of a social safety net, and frequent industrial accidents all seem to suggest the Chinese regime is sitting atop a volcano. Growing national sentiment will disrupt an economic rise premised on openness uh, to, uh, to the world. Now, my own view is uh, very different. My view is that China has already transited. It is no longer the Mao regime. It is a very different kind of political regime. It'd be called uh, right authoritarian populist regime. It's very similar to regimes which existed in the uh, interwar periods in Central and Eastern Europe. They were very stable regimes. Uh, they were done in only by foreign armies uh, um, uh, cross, crisscrossing uh, over them. And I see the uh, Chinese regime similarly as a very stable, resilient regime. I think it's done uh, brilliantly in terms of building infrastructure, managing uh, the uh, currency. Um, as Bill Overholt says, it has tremendous prestige in the world, and it's uh, for uh, good reasons. It has a rather uh, fabulous record, and it's quite unimaginable to me uh, that this regime is anything other than super uh, stable. And listing all the horribles proves nothing. You want to list all the horribles during uh, Britain's uh, 19th century industrialization, uh, with general strikes and chartist movements going to overthrow the government and so on, or the United States after the uh, uh, Civil War um, with the uh, most violent uh, crushing of labor movements of anywhere in the democracy world and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and lynchings and so on. Uh, unless you can show me that there's some logic which touches the political level and makes it uh, inherently unstable and really unpersuaded, I think it's a very, very uh, stable regime and therefore my basic uh, prediction is that uh, this system is going uh, to uh, continue. And if something does occur uh, because of some uh, trauma, such as uh, the uh, uh, markets that Terry was talking about, hedge funds, derivatives being uh, uh, not uh, controlled in any kind of way, lead to some kind of great financial uh, crisis, and therefore uh, people lose faith in currency for a period of time, and trade dries up and so on. I think the direction that uh, China would move in in that case would be a more nativist, militarist uh, kind of direction. People who would say that the reformers and openness had sold us out to the imperialists and look what you got because of them. It would be the naysayers um, who uh, uh, would come to power in that kind of a period. So those are my uh, two, uh, two predictions. I, I have absolutely no confidence in either. They just seem to me more reasonable than the others. Um, I don't know uh, whether it makes me hedgehog, hedgehog or, fo or fox. Given what Harry said, I hope it's a fox, um, but I don't know. The third question is, is China moving in a direction in a uh, political reform which is going to lead uh, to uh, a peaceful integration uh, which will lead on into uh, democratization? Now, on this issue in the uh, morning session, uh, we heard uh, views which are uh, all over the map. Um, on what is the nature of uh, China's uh, supposed integration uh, with the world. With the world. Um, it's a, it's a bi-condominium uh, with the United States, China and uh, uh, America are not friends. And to add one to it, Chaz Freeman in a recent talk, China is quite happy to have America uh, leading the, uh, leading, uh, the world. Um, none of these, uh, uh, I, I am closest absolutely, just to let you know, to uh, where uh, um, uh, Warren Cohn was in, uh, in his uh, uh, presentation uh, this morning on this, uh, on this issue. I'm going to actually try to read a little that I wrote on this one, if I can get away from it, because uh, it actually says something. In the conventional wisdom, the main mechanism of continuing political reform in China is global integration. Since China's rise is, is premised on taking advantage of the growth forces uh, latent in the uh, new age of globalization, China has to play by the rules of the game in order to compete and win and rise. To benefit from membership in the WO, China has to play by the rules of the WTO. But China actually doesn't just play by the rules of the uh, WTO. Its goal is not to serve the WTO. Its goal is to serve China. Um, and therefore, it opposes uh, things which are helpful to Taiwan. It does its best to prevent the WTO from in investigating whether China is or is indeed playing by the rules. 
Yeah, th this is to be expected. Uh, the Chinese government is to, meant to serve uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese interests. Um, and it doesn't go along with an American set of rules. And that is not necessarily a bad uh, thing. Uh, to take uh, two cases where I think China did brilliantly by ignoring uh, the Americans. Um, at, the, uh, in, at WTO, when dealing with TRIPS, Trade and Intellectual uh, Property, um, uh, China joined uh, behind the effort of uh, India, South Africa, and Brazil uh, to change the rules which allowed uh, Big Pharma uh, to prevent uh, retroviral drugs going into uh, uh, Southern Africa, uh, generics from India and Brazil at very, uh, at very low prices. And the Chinese side won, and the American side, and the Europeans, mostly Europeans, uh, ca eventually caved in. Well, I think China uh, changed the rules, and they were on the side of uh, the angels in, uh, in doing this. And if you take a look recently what's happened uh, with uh, North, uh, North Korea, it's certainly resisted uh, the great hegemon's view of how to uh, handle the uh, problem. Um, and it uh, banged lots of heads. I think they get most of uh, the credit for uh, uh, the result that we have today. I certainly hope the result uh, holds. And if it does hold, I think Chinese uh, who uh, made it uh, hold deserve to be nominated for a Nobel uh, Peace Prize. And ignoring uh, George Bush's uh, notions of axes of evil and regime change. And, uh, and so on. So why should they play by uh, the American rules? Their, their goal is to serve uh, Chinese interests, and there's no reason why they should see American interests as good uh, for uh, Chinese. Besides which, they see that the American uh, real goal is to uh, spread democracy around the world, which as they understand it means undermining the Chinese Communist Party government, making China weaker, preventing its uh, rise, and what Chinese patriot would w want to be on the, uh, on the side of that? Besides which, the Americans to the Chinese look totally hypocritical. They'll give you a long list of uh, dictators that the United States uh, used to support, from Park Chung-hee to Augusto Pinochet, to those they presently see support from Musharraf to the royal family in uh, Saudi Arabia. So China's not just going to go along with what the Americans uh, want. And even when they get involved in international organizations, they're the leading uh, contributed to peacekeeping or organizations of the UN. Uh, the reason for it was because they thought that America was manipulating PKOs uh, to serve the causes of democracy, which are a bad thing from the Chinese point of view. And they got involved to make sure the Americans couldn't play a game which the uh, Chinese did not want to, uh, did not want to see uh, uh, played. To take another instance where the Chinese look on the side of the angels by ignoring uh, the American rules of uh, the game, Asian financial crisis, 1997-98, the American view was that the, the Asian countries should go along with the uh, IMF. Uh, Japan had proposed an Asian monetary fund. The United States essentially uh, vetoed it. It had a bit, big impact on Chinese uh, thinking. It even made the point that you can do multilateral organizations, you could join with uh, Japan, uh, and you wouldn't want to go down the American way. In general, China creates organizations that they want to serve Chinese interests, which is the Shanghai Cooper Organiza Cooperation Organization, or uh, groups with, uh, uh, with Africans, which are linked all to China. But all of them have one thing in common. Uh, the goal is to make sure that Chinese interests are saved, and the first definition of Chinese interests is to not see the spread of uh, democracy uh, in the world. And in many ways, they have been totally successful in uh, this effort. Uh, final thought, since I'm being told my time is uh, running out. Um, I don't believe the United States should be supporting a democracy uh, in, uh, in China. For the United States to support it is to make it Western democracy. Um, it is to make it an alien product. It is to strengthen the hands of the people who are against China moving in uh, that direction. America has to learn something about the limits of its power in dealing with other great nations uh, in the world. And I don't think the United States knows how to do it anyway, even if uh, it did. And we should have a much more limited view of about what America could do in the world, but not forget the reality of what China is doing in the world and make up stories about happy integrations when, of course, they have their own visions of how the international world works. This doesn't mean doing nothing. I am a great believer we should be doing everything we can, not against China, but for human rights everywhere in the world. First and foremost, living up to it in the United States of America and making the United States open to people who will see what it looks like if you do it in the United States of America. And then have hopes that because the world is contingent and unpredictable, that things will occur as they recently just did occur, I think, where some single lone English professor in March of this year puts on his uh, blog the notion that maybe we should shame China 
and start calling it the Genocide Olympics as a way of putting pressure on Darfur. Darfur. And then Mia Farrow contacts Steven Spielberg, and Steven Spielberg contacts his friends in China, and China seems to move for the first time. They don't want to be uh, shamed. They do seek a dignified uh, place uh, in the uh, world order, and we should hold them accountable to that and uh, not think that that is nothing. Standing up for human rights does matter, even if it doesn't bring about democracy. Thank you.